this perfect model and you've gotten all your statistical distributions right, it's still possible for the dummy in the next cubicle to turn it on and operate it wrong. And the way I can explain that most clearly and easily is imagine that you've built a model of a fast food restaurant and you unlock the doors of a fast food restaurant at 10 o'clock in the morning and you want to know what is the average waiting time for a customer standing in line at your fast food restaurant. And you say, okay, well, between 10 o'clock and 10.30, I had two customers. Between 10.30 and 11, I had 15 customers. Between 11 and 12, I had 100 customers. And between 12 and 1, I had 500 customers. Well, if you turn the simulation on and run it from 10 o'clock to 1 o'clock, the average waiting time is going to be very skewed by the fact that nobody was eating lunch at the beginning and nobody was in the queue. You can accurately get the amount of time it takes a server to serve somebody, but that's not the same as the average amount of time that a person spent in the queue because all of those nobody in line periods is going to lower your average. So what you want your simulation to do is run until it gets into some kind of steady state so that you can shake out those imperfections or uncharacteristic times from the time you unlock the door until the real lunch period begins. That's how people can use the model wrong. Turn it on, collect data, give you the data back and you'd say, I could have sworn that somebody was waiting in line on average about six minutes, but the data tells me it's three minutes. It's because there was so much time run in the simulation that said, here's the zero minutes. Simulation programming languages. We started thinking about it in the 1950s. And in 1960, Tauscher and Owens at General Electric invented one that they called the General Simulation Program. And essentially what we're looking for is a language that allows you to build simulations efficiently. When you create a programming language, most people are used to building general purpose programming languages. Ones that are so general and so flexible that you can build anything with them. Well, that's really good, but it causes you to do more work towards any specific application. It's just as possible to build a language that focuses specifically on one problem domain. And it can write a program in that problem domain very, very easily. But it writes a program in another problem domain with great difficulty, or maybe it's impossible. Well, these languages evolved. From that first one in 1960, we shook out six key characteristics of a simulation specific programming language. The first one was that a simulation specific programming language has to be able to generate random numbers. Now most general purpose programming languages today can do that. It also has to be able to transform those random numbers into statistical distributions. Most general purpose programming languages cannot do that. A lot of them have add-on math libraries that can do some of that, but not all of it. It has to be able to do list processing. In other words, you don't have to write your own linked list routines. All you have to do is say, here, take this object or take this event and queue it up. And the data goes somewhere in the bowels of the language and gets stored for you and will be returned to you again later. It has to be able to do statistical analysis. It has to be able to find the mean and the standard deviation for you. You don't write the software for that. It's already embedded in the language. It has to be able to do report generation. So when it's done, it will dump you out a report that says, here's the average waiting time for a customer in line. Here's the average time that one of your operators took to serve a person. That information gets dumped out for you. And you can customize it, but it'll dump you reports without you ever writing a line of code to dump reports. And finally, it has to have some kind of timing executive. It's not your responsibility to write the code to cause it to loop around, pause, uh, to order up events in the right order. It does all that for you. That's what a simulation specific programming language is. Now so far you're going, so when do you see one? When you see one, you'll understand better. If you write a simulation with one of these languages, you find out that to create your simulation, you have to write the main function. You have to write the event handlers, the things that say this event goes with this function or this method or this object. You have to associate the incoming events with the objects that execute them. Beyond that, the language does most of it for you. There are algorithms that do initialization for you. There are algorithms that do all your timing for you. 
There are algorithms which do all your statistical distributions and all your mathematical operations for you. There are algorithms which do the list checking to see if you're finished with your simulation or if you need to loop back and go around again. And when you are finished, they will dump a report out for you. So you write much less software using this language than you would if you wrote the same simulation from scratch in C++ or Java or some other general purpose language. Simulation language evolution. I mentioned that we spit out GSP in 1960. Also around that time, the process interaction group spit out GPSS. Now many of you who took a discrete event simulation course in college might have used GPSS as your programming language. That's a very popular teaching language because it's very easy to learn. Well in the next five years we went from having two of these languages to having 15 of them. And in the ensuing five years we added another nine and then we added a couple more and you see it's slowing down. In the 80s we added a few more and then we kind of stopped adding specific languages. But if you look up on that chart, one of the things you'll see is that the GPSS language has like its own family tree. It's evolved all the way from the 50s to today and it's still out there as a simulation language and as simulation tools. You also see that GASP started out early and evolved down into SLAM and Simon. And you'll see that probably the most popular, at least the most widely known language, SimScript, evolved in the 60s and is still with us today. Those are some of the languages, that, the family trees of those languages. Uh, one of the trees on there that kind of went extinct was the ops language. It was developed at MIT and was used at universities but really didn't become a viable commercial product. GPSS is the one that went through all the translations of different people adapting it, different companies taking the language and creating their own commercial tool from it. And they, here's an example of GPSSH. That is the simulation for people arriving at a barber shop, getting their hair cut, and then going out the door. It's called a single server queue. That's all the code that you have to write in the simulation specific language. That's what the goal was all about. Instead of writing all of the software to manage the list of these things, to generate them coming into the queue, to, to decide how long it takes the barber to give you a haircut. All you do is write this code and all of the rest of that is embedded in the language itself. That's the advantage. Simula was also listed on the simulation language family tree. Most of you know Simula as the grandfather of object-oriented programming. That's what it's much more famous for. It was first developed as a simulation specific language and later in 1967 they added its object-oriented programming capabilities and it was from there that you said, ah, we know how to build things like C++ and the other object-oriented languages. Then GASP became SLAM, became SIMON and a SLAM program for that same, pro that same problem looks exactly like this and that's all you would write. Now you can see some similarities between GPSS and SLAM and then the third language is Simon. Uh, you can see similarities there too. They're looking for ways that you can work with these tools efficiently. Ways that you don't have to become a master lifelong de dedicated programmer to use them. So you can create simulations by being a little bit of a programmer instead of completely a programmer. SimScript came out in 1963. It was a RAND project. Some people at RAND invented the language and the guy who wrote the manual for SimScript 1 was Herbert Carr. And he recognized the commercial value of this language and he went off and spun out Khaki. And Khaki is now the primary vendor for SimScript tools. So you go out and you buy SimScript, you're usually buying a Khaki tool. But back in the 60s it was a government project that invented it. <clears throat> There's the SimScript program for a single server queue. They try to make their programming languages read as close as possible to English sentences. So you can look at it and the, the keywords and the variables can actually be read. So you can almost read what's printed there. Self-documenting code. Now as nice as simulation programming is, it has one drawback. 
you still have to write a program. And some people are saying, I am not writing any computer program. I will not do that. And that's how we got into simulation visualization. We got to the point where you could drag and drop boxes and ovals and connectors on the screen, connect them together, and specify almost everything to do with that, that simulation program. You double click on some of these objects and type in the numbers that specifically describe how fast the barber works, etc. And you can create these programs using graphical tools now. Well, as soon as you got a graphical tool running, what do you want it to do? You want it to animate. Wouldn't it be great to build a model of a factory assembly line to describe it graphically, to describe how fast the mach machines work with graphical tools and entering a few data values, and then to turn it on and actually to see little pieces of material move through the factory, get assembled into larger pieces, and to see it working in front of you, to actually see the pieces of material queue up at bottlenecks in the system. Couldn't you learn a lot of lessons watching the animation, which you would otherwise have to study the output file to discover? Yes, that's exactly right. And so there's a lot of work going into creating animations and visual tools that, that hide that simulation language. And the simulation language is now being referred to as the scripting language behind the tool.